Yes, indeed. Hi, Sam, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, great. OK, well, um, thank you so much for the invitation. And that was a, a really nice introduction. Um, I also would uh, echo Talia's uh, uh, congratulations on all your efforts uh, for, for putting this together. Um, this is a talk about uh, scientific fraud, scientific misconduct. Um, we thought we'd start the conference with a bang. I guess this is the some of the most outrageous uh, uh, stuff that scientists can do. Um, and I know we're all feeling um, slightly unproductive during the uh, during the pandemic. So I thought I'd start off with one of the more uh, prolific um, uh, people that we have in the world of scientific fraud, uh, someone who's really done a, a huge amount of work um, in terms of writing fraudulent and dangerous uh, and awful scientific papers. And it is um, this chap here who is, uh, his name's Yoshitaka Fuji. He is the world's most prolific scientific fraudster as measured by retractions. And I should say that we know about uh, um, uh, as well. I mean, there are, I'm, I'm, uh, it's possible that there are that there are others. Um, and when I think of scientific fraud, what I think about is, is, is this guy. And I think about all his friends at the top of the retraction watch leaderboard. These are the top 10 uh, most retracted scientists. So these are people who have fabricated or uh, falsified data or plagiarized papers. And you can see there that there are um, there are enormous numbers of, of papers uh, for, for each of them have been retracted. Um, my own subject, psychology, gets a little um, mention there in, uh, in number five, Diederik Stapel, who uh, Sam mentioned in his talk earlier on. Um, and uh, you can see uh, that you know Fuji is well, well ahead of the of, of of everyone in terms of the number of uh, retractions. Um, but you know, uh, th and this changes quite a lot. You can see the link there. It's always worth uh, checking in every so often to see just how bad it can get in terms of uh, uh, retraction. Now, articles aren't always retracted because of fraud. They're sometimes retracted for uh, innocent reasons. I don't think there are any innocent reasons in this top 10. I think these are all instances of scientific misconduct. But of course, when you're focusing on uh, the very top 10, uh, that might be uh, somewhat misleading. Uh, you might want to ask, you know, how often does this actually happen? How often do scientists make up their data or falsify their data um, just in, in, uh, in, in the everyday scientific kind of population? So in terms of defining uh, as, as fabricating or falsifying your data, this is how many scientists say when you just ask them, have you ever done this? Have you ever committed uh, uh, fraud? This is how many scientists say that they have. So have you ever done it? 1.97% of scientists say that they have. Now, that's a, um, a, a a terrifying number, I think. That's kind of the sort of number that would keep you up at night, uh, although it seems quite low. Um, you know, 2% of scientists um, making up their data is, is, I think, rather rather scary. When, however, you ask them if they think that their colleagues have ever committed scientific fraud, um, what you find is that 14% uh, percent of them uh, uh, say that that's the case, um, and 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 that is a really hair-raising number. It's from a, a meta-analysis of um of of surveys of this research that was done in two thousand nine. So again, um, slightly out of date. Um, someone needs to probably update this at some point soon. But um, uh, that's the that's the best numbers we have of of how many scientists fabricate or falsify their data. So what I thought I would do here is um talk about how these people get caught. So the 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 things that have happened. Uh, um, that, have, that have busted scientific frauds. Now, the disclaimer here is that um, these are just uh, some. Some of these people have have not admitted to fraud. Some of these people have not been like fully investigated by the universities. Um, so um, I'm just saying that these are alleged scientific frauds. Um, and so we'll just change that slightly. So it's oops. So it's uh, uh, how alleged scientific frauds get caught. Um, please, please don't uh, please don't sue me. Um, and here are. Oh, keeps jumping on. So here are some of the here are some of the main reasons that that, that um, alleged scientific frauds get caught uh, or scientific people committing scientific misconduct uh, get caught out. One of them is that they make absurd uh, and unrealistic claims. One of them is that they have data that turns out to be impossible or extremely improbable. Um, some of them have uh, their their fraud hidden in plain sight. And some of them, it's the sheer audacity of the fraud, the uh, the, the sheer um, uh, 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 profile, high profile of the fraud that they commit that, that 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 gets them that gets them caught. 
So the first one is uh, one that's close to home. This is uh, uh, something that should, which has been investigated by uh, um, my own uh, uh, university, King's College London, uh, very recently. This is the story of Hans Eysenck and Ronald Grossarth Matichek. Now, Hans Eysenck was in the 90s the most, uh, or I think I think across the whole 20th century, he was the the um, one of the very most cited psychologists. Certainly in the 90s, he was the most cited living psychologist. I think only uh, Freud and Piaget were more cited than, than Hans Eysenck was. Uh, so he did all sorts of work on, uh, well, a, a huge range of things, but the, the thing we're going to be focusing on here is, is, is personality. He started uh, in the 1980s working with Ronald Grossarth Matichek, who's a, a, a psychotherapist, on uh, a range of different uh, papers that claimed that you could predict whether someone was going to die of a fatal disease like uh, uh, heart disease or cancer um, from their personality. And they developed personality questionnaires that could apparently uh, uh, differentiate the different types of people. So the heart disease prone personality, the cancer prone personality, the healthy personality and so on. And um, most of you will be familiar, I'm sure, with with personality questionnaires. But just to point out, you know, sometimes uh, if you if you have a kind of yes no question in a in a personality questionnaire, it often looks something like this. It looks like, can you get a party going? Uh, you know, and that would be that would be testing whether someone is extroverted or or, or introverted. Um, that would be one way of, of doing that. You'd ask them lots of questions along those kind of lines. Or um, do you enjoy sunbathing? You know, there's another kind of another kind of question that that, that you might you might ask in a personality questionnaire. The personality questionnaires that were asked on the questionnaire by Eysenck and Grossarth Matichek um, were not like this. Here is an example item of a personality questionnaire, uh, for, for, sorry, from their personality questionnaire. So this is one of the questions, and this is a yes, no response. You have to give a yes, no response to the following question. Do you change your behavior according to consequences of previous behavior, i.e. do you repeat ways of acting which have in the past led to positive results such as contentment, well-being, self-reliance, etc. and to stop acting in ways which lead to negative consequences, i.e. to feelings of anxiety, hopelessness, depression, excitement, annoyance, etc. In other words, have you learned to give up ways of acting which have negative consequences and to rely more and more on ways of acting which have positive consequences? So if you could just uh, answer yes or no to that one. It's a shame we don't have a, the survey set up for that at the moment, but obviously everyone immediately knows whether they have a yes or no answer uh, to that one. Obviously, uh, what I'm trying to point out is that it seems it would be it would seem somewhat unlikely if uh, uh, this question was specific enough to make a good prediction of whether someone was going to die of a particular disease, right? Uh, and yet so this and questions like it um, were some of the most impressive, some of the most impressive predictions of people's mortality risk of any psychological variable. So um, uh, it, it, there, there are studies, longitudinal studies that, that, that were done, uh, apparently in, involving thousands of participants. 38.5% of the people who were uh, deemed cancer prone by these kind of questions uh, died of cancer, compared with only 0.3% of people with the healthy personality. So that's, that's, a, that's a risk of 120 times uh, uh, for the for the people who had answered in the way that I think and Grossart Matichek claimed was the cancer prone response. Um, compared with healthy subjects, people with the, the heart disease prone personality were 27 times more likely to die of, of heart disease. And then they did a psychotherapy trial. 32% um, of the control subjects who didn't get uh, a special psychotherapy from Grossart Matichek died of cancer and none of the people who did get the, the psychotherapy uh, died in the next 13 years. And as uh, Anthony Pelosi, who's a critic of this research, has said, um, these results are unheard of in the entire history of medical science. So um, something is going very wrong here. Either there's been an enormous mistake or perhaps scientific fraud has been committed or some other explanation that, uh, that I can't think of. So this, this happened in the, in, the, in the 80s and 90s. All these collaborative papers were published. Um, uh, there was a, a large amount of critique and debate in the British Medical Journal in 1991, 1992, and then basically nothing happened. The articles were just left in the journals that they were published in, kind of under a pall of suspicion. They didn't get that many citations because the results were completely absurd and people thought they were uh, uh, rather ridiculous. But just in the last year, uh, um, King's College London has done an investigation and has found that these papers are unsafe um, so it's, uh, and recommended to the journals that they were retracted. 
and actually just as of February, um, they started getting retracted. So 13 were retracted, 61 uh, papers got an expression of concern, um, and it could be uh, a very, very many papers, and actually I think could end up, um, and Gross of Matchcheck could end up on that top 10 retraction watch list that I showed you, um, if, if all the papers end up being uh, uh, retracted. And I think the interesting thing that this brings up is, it's hard to tell sometimes when something is 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 fraud necessarily, right? You, you, it, it's not that there's a, um, that th there's a, 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 a some easy test that you can do. The results look completely ridiculous. But of course, ridiculous results are also consistent with people just being extraordinarily sloppy in the way that they put together their research. So um, one uh, other example from the kind of history of psychology is Sir Cyril Burt, who um, was widely accused of, of making up results on uh, the heritability of, of IQ tests um, in, his, in his twin uh, data. Um, and the, the very famously, you know, fraudulent numbers. These were uh, heritability numbers that uh, they were uh, identical to the to the third decimal place, even after he kept adding more uh, twins into his into his study. Um, there's a decent explanation that that, that, that was actually just a, a model. It was just sloppiness that that explained those particular numbers. Although there are other numbers in other bits of Sir Robert's work that are much more likely to be actually fraudulent. And in fact, there were some actions that he took, some things that he did that also uh, indicates a rather kind of devious personality. So one of his students wrote that uh, Bert showed him a paper he had written under our joint names, and I thought it was very good. I was rather surprised when it finally appeared in the British Journal of Educational Psychology, and that, by the way, is a, uh, a journal that, that Bert was, uh, um, was the editor of, um, in 1939, with only my name at the top and with many changes in the text, praising Cyril Burt. Now, I don't think that sounds like someone who has a great deal of scientific integrity. And the interesting thing here is that the student, Burt's student who, who wrote that uh, uh, quote and who wrote that paper with him um, was, was Hans Eysenck. Um, and um, I think that just goes to show something. The um, the, the, the next thing is that, um, you know, and, and we've already we've already talked about suspicious uh, uh, n numbers, but sometimes the raw data themselves can be very suspicious, too. So um, this is a, um, uh, a researcher, a, a kind of rising star in the world of spider biology. So he studied social spiders and the, um, the uh, uh, relation between the size of a uh, uh, social group spiders were in and the, uh, the, the they're, they're actually their personalities in many ways. So it relates back to I think in some ways because he's looking at personality. And um, he interestingly for what we're talking about open open science and so on, he actually posted all his data online. He worked with many different collaborators. Uh, so he um, uh, sent data sets from spiders that he had observed out to collaborators um, at lots of different universities. And um, uh, because the data were, were posted online alongside the papers, people were able to notice anomalies in those data. And in fact, once his co-authors looked into those anomalies, which they hadn't noticed before they published the papers, um, they confirmed that there were very many um, problems in his, um, in his data set. So uh, Jonathan Pruitt has now seven retractions, I think. And there may even be more than that, um, but that's the last number that I could find. He denies that this is fraudulent. He says that there are maybe mistakes and, and, and so on. But um, he got himself into, into really deep trouble. And I think this is just another uh, a, a really interesting example because he was following the open science guidelines, right? He was putting his data online. And I think if, if he was uh, 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 making the data up, if they were fraudulent, then it really takes a really brass neck to post fraudulent data sets online for the whole world to see. Uh, so there's an article in Nature you can read uh, about about that from earlier in the year. Um, his co-authors started noticing uh, all these repeated uh, numbers in in his in his data. These are um, uh, measures of spider movements which were taken to the you know the, the millisecond or even even fractions of a millisecond. And yet, for for many of the different spiders, uh, these different individual spiders, these measures were exactly the same to the second decimal point. Um, and in fact, there were repeated elements across lots of different parts of the data. So um, again, entirely different spiders with rows of, uh, and, and, and columns of, of identical data. Some researchers um, uh, have found uh, in one of his Excel sheets um, uh, a formula that was used to, so to, to possibly, if he was being fraudulent, which, you know, 
uh, if he was being fraudulent, it, would, it looked like that formula was being used to, to alter the numbers in another in another row of the spreadsheet, and that was just left in uh, and, uh, and 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 put on, on online and shared. That's a uh, that's not one of the spiders that he studied. That's one of those spiders that um, uh, is pretending to be an ant. It's, I thought it would be appropriate because it's 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 a spider and it's deceiving uh, people. Whatever. Um, and so those data were, were just sitting there. They were just hiding in plain sight. Uh, they were waiting for anyone to come along and, and, and discuss them. And can you imagine, can you imagine finding that someone that you've worked with, who you've published several papers with, who you've, um, you know, maybe you've gone to conferences and presented that that uh, research, and then you find that that person has been deceiving you the whole time. You've, you, you, you have to lose all your trust in one of your uh, co-authors. Um, it's a terrifying thing and, and it could happen uh, to, to any of us. It's, it's happened to, to very many people and they, they, uh, they very rarely um, uh, suspect it. So here's another example of how uh, uh, data can uh, be fabricated or, or, uh, or altered, falsified. Um, this is a, a, a set of lanes of a Western blot. They've been kind of rearranged um, in this in this Nature article, but um, they uh, are from a paper in, that was published in PLOS One. And so you can see here all the different lanes and to the, you know, if you just take a quick look at this, they, they seem like they're, you know, perfectly normal blurs from a Western blot. They're all kind of irregular sizes and, and shapes. And, you know, maybe these show important aspects of the of, of the experiment, the particular proteins. However, um, it turns out that many of these lanes, and these are supposed to all be different, um, are identical and they have been uh, uh, photoshopped in such a way, you know, some of them have been stretched out a bit, uh, compressed down. Um, you can see the, you know, the green one here is is a shorter version of the of the of the green one at the at, at the bottom, and, and uh, another one here. So this is a very very common way that scientists commit uh, fraud in articles is that they have it sitting there in the figures of their articles. You know, they're in, they're on the PDF pages. They're not hidden away in a supplement or anything. They're right there, staring you right in the face. But it just takes the right sort of person to be able to notice that these have been photoshopped, that these have been falsified. Um, and the right sort of person is uh, Elizabeth Bick, who is, a, um, I think, the only person who's pictured in this talk who is not a scientific fraudster, but is in fact a hero and is in fact a, uh, someone who's busting scientific fraud uh, on a regular basis. And she uh, and her colleagues um, uh, visually checked uh, uh, 20, 000, over 20,000 papers from 40 journals and found that 3.8% had problematic images so so like this one here had images that looked like it had uh, some some degree of of duplication or or, or fabrication in there um, and you can see that actually that 3.8 percent number is is actually um in more recent years it's actually somewhat higher uh, than that so it seems to be getting worse in terms of the date of the of the of the journal now that could be because software makes it somewhat easier now for people to manipulate uh, um, uh, images in, in scientific papers but that's, it's, it's not clear obviously um, what, what the cause of all this stuff is um, and so uh, it's very interesting because um, th th this leads, leads us on quite nicely to our final uh, reason which is really audacious frauds um, which is here's an example that again Elizabeth Pick has posted. Uh, she posted this online on PubPeer, which is the um, uh, website you can use to kind of uh, raise questions about um, uh, worrying, dodgy looking scientific papers, um, whether it's the data or the pictures or something else about them. Um, and you can see here that um, uh, th these are uh, uh, cross sections of um, it's the little organs inside the ear that are to do with kind of balance and rotation and, 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 and so on from lots of different species. And you can see that these um, these cross sections are, um, I mean, it, it really astonishes me that someone could notice that there are kind of repeated elements in these in these pictures, but there are. And this was a paper published in the Journal of Neurophysiology in 2005, um, which made up part of someone's uh, PhD thesis. And you can see that the, uh, the, the you know there are there are repeated elements in these in in, in these figures. I mean, it's as I say, astonishing uh, uh, that someone would notice. Um, but what an odd thing to do to uh, to to um, fabricate images like this if indeed that's what has happened. But the reason I bring this up is that the person who um, uh, is, is was the lead author of this paper in the Journal of Neurophysiology is uh, Sapan Desai, who you may recognize his name because he's been in the news in the last few days because he was the co-author on two papers on uh, hydroxychloroquine. Uh, Sam mentioned this in his introductory talk. Um, hydroxychloroquine, uh, these were observational uh, trials 
where they showed that hydroxychloroquine um, not only was it ineffective in preventing uh, uh, death from COVID-19, but it was actually dangerous. It actually had side effects. It caused um, uh, some side effects that actually caused a higher degree of, 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 of death. Um, so that Lancet paper, which is the, the top one there, um, actually caused the World Health Organization to suspend several of its trials into whether hydroxychloroquine uh, worked. Now, um, uh, this was um, so Sapan Desai is the, um, the, the, the head of a, a small um, research company called Surgisphere, um, uh, and they apparently had access to these large data sets of patient data from, from lots of different countries, and they shared them with um, some researchers. So the other researchers um, are from uh, uh, the Brigham and Women's uh, uh, Hospital, which is part of Harvard University. So some of the top researchers in the world. These are the top two medical journals in the world, the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine. And um, of course, you know where this is going. Um, in the past uh, week or maybe just over a week, um, both of these articles have been retracted because people noticed problems with the data, uh, issues issues uh, with the um, with Surgisphere itself, um, and uh, Desai would not share the raw data with the co-authors that had published the the the, the studies with him. So he um, uh, uh, gave them data which. It seemed very odd that he wouldn't have access to it. Surgisphere is a tiny company, and yet they had um, thousands and thousands of patients' data with no kind of paper trail as to where that data came from. And also there were some anomalies in the data. So for instance, they reported more deaths due to COVID in their data set than had been re recorded by the government in Australia, for instance. So I think they had seven or eight more deaths in their data set than actually existed in, in, in reality. Something had gone very wrong. Um, could it be that this is fraudulent. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's impossible to say at the moment and we need a, a kind of proper investigation into it and people are investigating. Um, part of the investigation is why the um, the, the dodgy figure from uh, 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 Desai's PhD thesis and his paper um, was discovered, but um, we still don't we still don't know exactly what happened there in terms of the uh, um, uh, you know the provenance of these of these data. But imagine what a, a, an absolute disastrous situation this is. Not only did the WHO uh, halt their trials and it's actually caused a material change in the way that, the way that they're looking at the data, but also um, it, it hands uh, ammunition to people who were um, uh, supporting the use of hydroxychloroquine, um, which is unproven for COVID-19 at the moment. There's no there's no evidence either either way really. Um, it hands ammunition to those people to say, look, there's a there's a concerted effort to try and do down hydroxychloroquine and say it's bad. Um, and and you know what? Having looked at these papers, it's impossible to 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 say that that's not the case. So there's a, a case where scientific uh, uh, misconduct, and I would say that there it is misconduct to not share your data with your co-authors, and it may even be bordering on misconduct to not look at the, at the data. You may have noticed um, they had to ask him for the data after they had published the paper. What a strange situation to be in to um, to, to publish a, a hugely important uh, analysis of data and not having looked at any of those data yourself. Um, so I think what we can what we can conclude from all this is this is here's some tips on how to commit scientific fraud and, and avoid avoid being caught. The first thing is that keep your claims fairly circumspect. There's no point in making large, absurd claims that you can uh, uh, tell whether um, a person is going to die of cancer to some extremely high uh, uh, probability or save them from getting cancer just using your psychotherapy course and your and your uh, your, your your personality questionnaire. Um, don't make it too obvious in the data set that you've fabricated it. Real data sets look quite messy a lot of the time. Um, and the reason that um, so many frauds get caught when the, when the data are shared is that it's very obvious that, uh, that, that the data are too, um, uh, uh, um, maybe they, they, look, they just look a little bit too pristine uh, to be real. Um, hiding fraud in plain sight is a terrible idea as well, um, especially when there are people like Elizabeth Bick around who might catch uh, uh, your repeated element in your in your um, in your data set. Uh, sorry, in your in your image, I should say. And uh, committing fraud for a hot button issue, especially like COVID-19 is right now, um, or putting it in a high impact journal like the New England Journal of Medicine or the Lancet, um, seems like quite a bad idea as well because you get all the extra extra scrutiny. A lot of the most famous fraud cases are from articles published in Nature, Science, places like that, where you know the the world is watching, the world is looking at these at these claims, um, and and uh, and and giving them the scrutiny that they uh, that they desire that they deserve. A really scary thought um, 
obviously I'm being slightly tongue in cheek and saying that this is how to commit fraud and not get caught. But a, 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 a scary thought is that there are almost undoubtedly lots of fraudsters out there who have followed the rules uh, 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 on this slide and are flying under the radar, may never get caught, uh, have published articles in journals which look realistic enough, make, you know, claims that are interesting enough to get published, but not uh, uh, too exciting or, or, or uh, flamboyant, um, and just are sitting there in our scientific literature, polluting our literature, and we will never find out. And that's a, uh, another thought to keep you up at night. So the question is, I mean, we're, we're going to be seeing lots of detail later today as to um, the kind of the reasons that the uh, that scientific um, problems uh, arise. But one reason why this one set of reasons why fraud in particular keeps happening. I mean, uh, James Heathers, the uh, uh, meta scientist and uh, neurophysiologist, had a, an article in The Guardian uh, last week talking about how peer reviewers aren't expected to pick up on fraud. It's not the case that peer reviewers um, are, are told to go into the, the, the individual data themselves and find, oh, that those those two uh, cells look identical, like, you know, like that spider data set I showed you. That's not expected. And in fact, it's not possible in a lot of cases because scientists don't share the data with each other while uh, undergoing peer review. So the peer review process, which we view as this kind of uh, uh, um, uh, bulwark against uh, incorrect claims and, and, and so on, um, may, may not be in practice. When you commit fraud, you have full control over your results. You can make your results precisely the sort of thing that you think the reviewers and the editors at the journal want. So you're 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 making a data set that looks exactly right, and and also your co what your co-authors want too. And um, you're making a data set that looks exactly right for the journal. So you have full control. It's not like the messy world of of real data. Um, and uh, as you've seen. Pub many publications, uh, worldwide fame, sometimes you know uh, uh, monetary rewards as well, await people who uh, uh, commit successful fraud and have their and have their articles accepted, their fraudulent articles accepted in some of the world's uh, biggest journals. And it often, again, as we've seen in this talk, uh, can take years and sometimes decades for any detection of the fraud to happen, any punishment, any retractions of the articles. Um, it's an extremely um, a long process to, to to find any fraud. I mean, the, those Lancet New England Journal of Medicine articles are a kind of exception in this case because they were retracted within about two weeks um, of publication. But that's uh, the extremely unusual situation of the COVID-19 pandemic focusing people's attention on uh, on these articles um, where the vast majority of scientific frauds are sitting there for years before anyone finds out about them. And uh, Sometimes in some cases, um, universities and colleagues and, uh, and others cover up the fraud that their researchers do because it looks understandably very bad for their reputation if they have a, a fraudulent researcher um, on, on board. So um, uh, those are some reasons. We're going to hear about more reasons about the incentives of academia and so on that can push people towards finding results. I mean, psychologically, uh, um, it's possible that fraudsters commit uh, fraud because they actually believe the results. They believe themselves that those results are true and they just want to give them a little push in the in the direction of being convincing. So the question is, do scientists perhaps trust each other a bit too much? It's something to think about over the over the rest of the day. Um, uh, uh, the um, during the Cold War, Ronald Reagan uh, uh, kept repeating this uh, Russian uh, Russian proverb of uh, trust but verify. And I guess my argument in this talk is that scientists do a lot of the first bit, but um, but often forget uh, the latter part. So um, I'm happy to take any any questions that you have. And thanks very much for for uh, for listening. Um, feel free to get in touch uh, uh, as well. But um, that is me done for now. So I will hand back over to Sam. Thank you very much, Stuart. That was a wonderful talk. Again, a lot of positive feedback from Twitter and, and everywhere else. Yes. I just want to exercise uh, a bit of reproducibility and self-correction now. Roger Gina Sirona, uh, Sirola um, has, has, has informed me that Ioannidis did not mathematically demonstrate that most published research is untrue, despite the claim in his title. To reach that conclusion, you need to have presume that most tested hypotheses have highly improbable priors. So I just wanted to clarify and avoid any confusion there. So I'm just going to take the top two or three questions in the time we have remaining. We have until about five past for anime. Mm -hmm. So the top one is by uh, Malika. Uh, she said, should retractions really be an indicator of fraud? Wouldn't this prevent honest people to correct their mistakes by fear of being judged as fraudulent if their paper gets retracted? 
Absolutely. I think that's a very good question. The um, We need to live in a world where scientists can admit their mistakes. We need to move towards a situation where retraction is not seen as something uh, career destroying or uh, embarrassing or, or or really scary to, 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 to do. Retractions and also corrections in cases where you know the whole paper doesn't need to be retracted but but it but it can be you know a table can be replaced or a figure can be replaced or whatever it is so we need to we need to move to, towards that situation and so it's possibly a bit unfortunate that retraction has been so strongly associated with scientific fraud um uh, uh the the, pro the problem is that the, the very very top um scientific fraud uh, uh the very very top uh, numbers of retractions are all indicated in, in um, instances of of misconduct or fraud of, of of some kind but absolutely i think we need to to um to, to differentiate that you know the number of retractions is increasing over time that's been shown in, in, in a couple of different papers but that could be not because scientists are getting more fraudulent it could be because editors are getting more aware of these problems or scientists are becoming more open to admitting that they have made a mistake that they've screwed up you know hands up i made an error there and um it's not just that uh, that that's a that, that's um something that scientists should do or anything but that's actually a, a really praiseworthy aspect of of, uh, of of some researchers and they, they must be able to admit when they've got something wrong Wonderful. Uh, we have a tussle for a few, the next few questions, and I think they have covered it. So um, I'm just going to try and pick one of the three that I think has not been really picked up yet. And the one I'm choosing is by Andrew Miller. Uh, he asks, is there any data on the effort, uh, brackets, person hours, invested in investigating an alleged fraud, i.e. Uh, what is the management cost? That's a, another great question. I don't know of any actual hard data on it. I know lots of anecdotes of people who have uh, looked into fraud uh, cases or, or uh, potential fraud cases and have spent hours, days, weeks, months, sometimes years of their life, and sometimes essentially uh, uh, you know, digging into the data first, but then bashing their head off a brick wall when it comes to talking to the universities um, that, these, that the, the alleged fraudsters um, work at, people who are um, uh, just ignored by journal editors who, uh, are, you know, again, are not incentivized to, to retract articles because it looks bad for their for their journal. Um, and so, um, yeah, I don't know about the actual the, 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 the cost, but it must be very, very high. Um, people normally who look into fraud are not paid to look into fraud, right? They're working scientists who who um, out of the, you know, their, their kind of sense of duty for the scientific community. Um, spend so much time looking into this. I mean, there's also a kind of internal motivation because it is fascinating to look at fraud. I mean, it's, we're all we're all interested to some degree in uh, in true crime, right? And this is as this is as best as you this is as close as you can get in science to to true crime, um, except if you're a forensic scientist, I suppose. But uh, the, the the point is that that um, you know it's an it's fascinating psychologically to look into that. Um, but I would love to see uh, a kind of even even a kind of qualitative study of um, uh, you know how much effort people put in. To, uh, to investigating fraud cases? Yeah, it's a great question. Okay, wonderful. So we did start slightly early. Amy is just on standby. Uh, just a, a, a word to the audience. So I think Stuart has already covered most of the top rated uh, questions. Um, so I guess we can just move on to, to Amy now. So thank you, Stuart. You can pop off now. Is that My on? See? It is, yeah, it is. Uh, Cheers, yeah. everyone. Cheers. Uh, do you have some shortbread too? Or? <laughs> okay. I'm not that much of a stereotype. <laughs> okay, thank you so much, Stuart. Thanks, Thanks Sam. Enjoy the rest of the day, everyone. Thank you. Uh, okay, so Amy, I'll I'll hand the keys over to you. So you can you you've got a few minutes extra time. So um, not slightly less pressure. So I'll hand it over to you. Thank you so much for coming today.